We're the closest we've been to Mars in two years, and the moon's going to move in front of it for millions of you around the world. Let's take a look at what you can go out to see in the night sky for January of 2025. I'm Michael Martin, and this is Late Night Astronomy. Happy New Year and welcome to your guide to the night sky. Let's kick off 2025 with a major meteor shower. The quadrantids is a difficult one to see because of how cold it is this time of year for many of us that live in the northern hemisphere. But if you're willing to brave the weather, let's load up my favorite astronomy app Sky Safari and go outside after midnight early in the morning on January 3rd. Begin by facing towards the northeast and look for the Big Dipper. The quadrantids will streak through the sky near the constellation Bootes. The moon will not be an issue for this meteor shower, and those of you who live on the west coast of North America will have a better chance of catching this shower near its peak. At its best, you might see 100 meteors per hour, but realistically, I'd expect maybe 20 to 30 meteors per hour, even if you're viewing it under darker skies. If you or your kids got a telescope for Christmas, the moon is the best target to start with. And let's begin with its phases this month, beginning with a first quarter moon on January 6th. Full moon January 13th. Last quarter moon January 21st. And a new moon on January 29th. The surface of the moon holds a wealth of targets to focus a pair of binoculars or a telescope on. One feature I enjoy on the lunar surface is known as the straight wall. It can be best viewed through a telescope this month by the night of January 8th, and is always a feature that catches my eye when I'm scanning across the lunar surface. The moon also makes several close passes to objects this month, beginning with Venus on January 3rd, M45 January 9th, and Jupiter on the 10th. Along with being close to several objects, the moon will pass in front of some objects as well in events known as occultations. On January 4th, the moon will pass in front of Saturn for those of you who live in parts of Europe and Africa. The star Elneth will be covered by the moon for people who live in parts of Asia, Australia, and New Zealand on January 11th. And the star Spica will be covered for parts of Africa on January 21st. But the main event for the moon this month involves it moving in front of the planet Mars. For many of us, this is going to occur on the night of January 13th into the early morning of the 14th as the moon moves in front of Mars for those of us who live in parts of Africa and North America. From where I live on the east coast of the United States, the moon will approach Mars throughout the night and will move in front of it around 9, 10 p.m. Over an hour later, around 10.24 p.m., I'll try to time it so that I can actually see Mars begin to reveal itself slowly from behind the lunar surface. This is going to be an amazing event to see with the naked eye, a pair of binoculars, or a telescope. And if you're interested in checking on the best time to see this from where you live, I'll be sure to leave a link to an excellent website called inthesky.org. If you're able to take any pictures or videos of this event, please be sure to share them with me over on Instagram at Late Night Astronomy. Not long after the occultation of Mars, we have its closest pass to Earth in an event known as opposition. During this time, about every 26 months, the orbits of Earth and Mars come to a point where they're at the closest to each other. On the night of January 15th, when it's at its closest to Earth, about three hours after sunset, Mars will be at a great height for observing and imaging. Through my 12-inch Dobsonian telescope, Mars starts to come alive around 150 times magnification, revealing surface details and polar ice caps. On a really clear and steady night, I'll push the telescope even farther to about 250 times magnification on this target. This is an amazing planet to view and image, but because of its size and distance to Earth, we really only get a couple months of exceptional views every two years, so take advantage of this opportunity to see it in great detail while you can. Also this month, look for Saturn and Venus to make a close pass to each other around January 18th 
for some great naked eye and binocular observations right after sunset. Neptune follows behind Saturn. Jupiter continues to be a great target throughout the entirety of the month as well, with Uranus right nearby. 2025 has a lot to live up to for comets after the past year that a lot of us just had seen them. And thankfully for my friends in the Southern Hemisphere, it's at least showing a little bit of promise starting off, because you might have an opportunity low to the horizon to go out to see Comet C2024 G3 Atlas. It'll make its closest approach to Earth around January 14th, but during this time it will be too close to the Sun for any observations, but will slowly move away from the Sun over the next few days, making for some possible yet difficult views of it near the horizon. You'll want to go out about 45 minutes after sunset, a couple days after its closest pass to Earth, to try and spot it with a pair of binoculars or a telescope. By the last week of January, you'll be able to get out about an hour after sunset to see it under darker skies, but it will also be more dim as it travels through the constellation Pisces Austrinus, the southern fish. This is going to be a tough one, but if you're able to spot it in the southern sky, please let me know where you saw it from and what your observations were in the comment section below. Everything we've looked at so far has been in our own astronomical backyard. Now let's travel into deep space. Avoiding light pollution and owning binoculars, and in particular a telescope, is going to be best to view these objects. Let's go outside about two hours after sunset and face towards the northwest. Look up until you come across the constellation Cassiopeia. To begin finding the deep sky objects we're highlighting this month, open clusters. Start by scanning this constellation with a pair of binoculars to see if you can spot any of these collections of stars. More than likely, you'll need a telescope to get the best views, so let's start by finding the star Rukbat. Star hop over until you come across NGC 457, the Owl Cluster. It contains over 100 stars and was discovered by William Herschel in 1787. Let's reset to Rukbat and now move our way over to M103. Shaped a bit like an arrowhead, this open cluster can be easy to miss, but shows the uniqueness of open clusters in their star formation, size, and brightness. Right near M103 is a more impressive and younger open cluster, NGC 663. Let's finish the night by leaving the constellation Cassiopeia to enjoy one of the best pair of open clusters in the night sky, NGC 869 and NGC 884, more commonly known as the double cluster. I can just barely fit these in the field of view of my 12-inch Dobsonian telescope at its lowest magnification, and sometimes prefer the view through a pair of binoculars. Compare the composition of these two open clusters and invite a friend over to enjoy the view. Never forget how incredible these objects are that you're looking at, and that most people have never seen them with their own eyes. Thanks for being a part of our journey through the night sky. If you've enjoyed this video, please like it and consider subscribing to this channel to join our growing community. But most importantly, let us know what questions you have and what you're hoping to get out to see in the comment section below. Thank you all so much for your continued support and clear skies from late night astronomy.